So welcome, Dennis. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Mike. It's good to see you. Yeah. So so a little bit about what we're getting ready to do. So what I thought, um, we're running kind of an experiment here with Leading Agile, and we're ta- doing this kind of casual format where I want to pick your brain for a little bit, right? And so you and I go way back. When did we first meet? Do you remember the story? I think it was 12 or 13 years ago. It's been a while. Um, I was working in my office down in Technology Parkway. David Anderson had been yeah. working with an APLN. Yeah, I was on the board with him at APLN. Yeah, yeah and I was doing some methodology work with Microsoft um, as a contractor. And David had read my stuff, read your stuff, and reached out to both of us and said, you guys should get together. You live like very yeah. close and you're thinking about this in very similar ways. Yeah. I thought that was kind of funny because, you know, back that was like pre-leading Agile. And so, you know, when David Anderson sends you an email and says, you should meet know this guy, it's like, okay. okay That's right. right. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll go meet this guy. <laughs> That's right. Talk about project management and things like that. So, so tell me a little bit about what you were doing before you and I started working together. What's your background? Well, there were a couple of big things I was doing. The, the, the fun fundamental foundational thing I'd been doing for a long time was kind of big project recoveries, going to the organizations that had spent a lot of money, were sort of in a difficult position with projects. I was doing it with Perot, I did it before, and turning big transformational projects around. So how do you get an organization to actually um, solve the problems you're paying to solve when they've wasted two-thirds of their money and they're two-thirds of the way through the schedule and the thing is a disaster? Mm-hmm. How do you like fix it? Yeah. And it turns out the way you fix it is you get everybody aligned on value, you get super clear backlogs, you find out what the real cadences, you finish work that you start, yeah. and you do that like at a project level. So it was, that was kind of cool. Um, the thing that I was doing like right before we met was I had been brought into uh, Microsoft as a contractor building out a business architecture practice yeah. there, a thing they called Motion. And that was based on some work I had done with um, with as, as a consultant several years ago where we were with a company that was acquiring a bunch of other like power companies, mm-hmm. and we were doing capability modeling. We were looking to see how do you bring companies together and merge them together. Again, it was kind of like pr- which process do you pick? But it was again, it was a big transformation. It was a project to integrate companies mm-hmm. and how do you pull them together quickly. So we were doing capability modeling. So I was helping Microsoft build a business architecture practice on on the tail of that. Yeah, so interesting. So I'm going to ask you a question I actually don't know the answer to. And so I'm taking a little bit of a chance here. But like, how did you get involved in business architecture and business cap- – well, actually, before I ask you that, like, what is business capability modeling? The thing that we were looking at was how do you look at an organization um, by what it produces, by the outcomes that it does – instead of by um, completing projects Mm -hmm. or by the processes. Um, And the way I got involved in that, so capabilities are looking at the network as a series of what the company does or how, not not how it does it. And then tying that together into a network and then applying lean principles to designing an organization that can get stuff done. Primarily applying it to projects Mm -hmm. because we were like trying to solve specific processes, but it's generally applicable at scale as well. The way I got into it was when I was at Pro Systems, I was working in Jim Champy's organization. And Champy was one of the guys that led business process reengineering. Mm-hmm. What we had learned by At the- Pro or like in- Well, he this, did it before. Him, okay. Jim, Hammer and Champy built, yeah. built BPR. Um, Pro hired uh, those guys. And so, so they were, they, uh, Champy was in there designing, he realized his shortcomings of business process reengineering. Because what that was, was go redesign all the processes, automate them, streamline individual processes. But it wasn't getting the results that it wanted. Mm-hmm. So we started looking at how do you look at an organization in a bigger sort of slice. Now, remember, we were doing contingency type deals. So we were walking and applying it to um, like a specific set of processes, but optimizing individual processes didn't solve the whole. Mm-hmm. So we started doing capability modeling to determine what the organization should look like and then going and fixing the interaction of capabilities rather than trying to fix individual processes. It was a lens to look at connecting outcomes together instead of... Um, uh, just running projects to the end. Yeah, so so I, I think you you took a stab at this at a, at a bit of a level, but tell me, like, let's go just a little bit deeper into what uh, business architecture, business capability modeling is. Like, what what is it? A business architecture is looking at the outcomes that an organization produces. Mm-hmm. It's breaking what an organization does to produce those outcomes down into measurable, definable um, uh, outcomes. Mm-hmm. And then looking at which ones are strategically important, which ones are performing poorly, which ones are too expensive for the value they bring to the company, doing an analysis of an organization Mm -hmm. to go figure out where to focus to um, apply limited resources. It's a portfolio management problem solving technique. Yeah. One of the problems with Six Sigma at the time and one of the problems with BPR was you can't redesign everything. You can't apply these techniques to a capability, to a process that getting better at is useless. Sometimes fixing it isn't a process problem, it's a technology problem, or sometimes it's 
not a technology problem. It's just an understanding problem. So you've got to be able to go and understand, is it important to get better at that? And what does it mean to get better at it? And it's not always get better at the technology, get better at the process. It's get better at producing the outcome. Okay, cool. So also about the time that you and I met, you were doing some work with PMI on the OPM3 initiative. Yeah, Did that's I get right. that right? That's right. So there's a reason I'm going to ask you this question because I'm going to set up the next thing I want to ask you. But tell me a little bit about the OPM3 thing and what you guys were trying to solve there. So OPM3 is looking at an organization, at their organizational project management, um, portfolio management, um, program management, OPM3, mm -hmm. looking at the capabilities in an organization and trying to determine um, based on the problems you're trying to solve in an organization, which capabilities do you have to get better at? It was a business architecture lens and a business analysis lens on top of organizations, but on top of um, project management, program management, portfolio management organizations. Well, so so you actually actually used a word exactly the way I wanted you to use it because you and I, for probably the first three years we were hanging out and talking about this stuff, we were using the words like capability and competency interchangeably, yes, right. right? Yeah. And so, and so I thought that was an interesting thing, right? So I thought that, um, like to me, like, and this is stuff I've learned from you, right? So, uh, like a, an, like a capability is something like, um, it's, it's value that the organization produces. And so like in some of the early, I think it was, um, maybe it was Merrifield's book rework, or maybe it came from your HBR article. I can't remember, but it was like, the like the ability to fax something is, not is a, a capability. Oh, it isn't a capability. No, not, um, send send a letter is the capability. Um, okay. Fax fax something is the process. Oh, is the, is the process? Got yeah. it. And yeah. So so that was the distinction. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but then there's like the OPM three world, right? And like the CMMI world is like around like the the. And I'm not going to get this word right either, but like the skills that you have. That's right. Right. So there's like the there's like the value that you produce. And then there's the organizational competencies where, that you where, need to produce wherewithal. them. The wherewithal. That's yeah. a good way so, of saying so, it. Yeah. So it becomes interesting. To like, like Six Sigma is about the process, mm -hmm. right? And BPR was about the technology. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the competency models, a lot of the was about the organization skills and stuff. All three of them are equally important. But if you're looking at just one in, in a vacuum, you might not be using the right problem to solve it. So the capability wraps around the layers. Yeah. And so I can assess the capability and then use the right tool to solve the problem. So so what was fascinating about some of mine and yours early work together is I remember sitting in front of your whiteboard in your conference room and we're like talking about lean and different things and trying to figure out where we had common ground and like what we understood and what we didn't understand. And I was working at version one at the time. And so like I'm like all in like not like team level scrum. But was I was operating in a different space, mm -hmm. candidly, right? And that was about the time that I was starting to develop the Teams backlogs, working tested software kind of. Um, I don't even know what you would call it, meme something. I it was like an idea, right? As a collection of ideas. And one of the things that you and I kind of came up with that I thought was fascinating: this merger of business architecture and the idea of Scrum teams is that a lot of times we think about Scrum teams as a product. Or maybe a feature set. Right. But in a lot of these large organizations we're going into, we're really, in effect, forming scrum teams around business capabilities. That's right. So talk to me a little bit about that. So what became really interesting as we were talking was um, why organizations aren't successful doing scrum mm -hmm. or delivering big projects or making change or trying to make um, to to deliver a product or on a promise they've made. And it, and it turns out that... Um, the thing you were talking about is we have to have stable teams built around solving a problem. And it, and in an organization, if capabilities are, in fact, persistent. Yeah, because that's the thing in the organization that typically doesn't change. That's right. Projects are transient. Process is transient. But the capabilities, capabilities are the things pro you produce. Probably pretty yeah. pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty persistent. And so if you're going to build scrum teams, instead of building scrum teams around projects, mm -hmm. you build scrum teams around um, capabilities. You can build persistent teams around persistent things. And then those scrum teams can become much more effective in an organization. Then you can start to get a clear backlog to them. The problem of orchestration between capabilities becomes a problem of orchestration of backlogs mm -hmm. between teams. Yeah. Right. And then you start to measure some of the lean stuff that we were doing at the time from uh, some of the Kanban and some of the learning that we were doing in that area was then you learn to measure them so you can orchestrate the dependencies, you can produce clearer throughput. You were looking at it from more of an organizational standpoint. And I was applying it like to solving problems, but it became really nice how it fit together. Well, it was it was fascinating because like, you know, you think about, gosh, 13, 14 years ago, 
where like I was going in literally installing version one software and training teams on how to do basic agile. And, and I would get asked questions that were like, well, um, I'm on six projects that are all doing scrum. Like, how do I, how do I go to six daily standup meetings? How do I do six reviews and retrospectives? And that like, that like put like a earworm in my brain. And I'm like, that's fascinating, right? Yeah, the impossible it, question. Yeah, so so the the idea is is that in order to f- do a well formed Scrum team, right, that can stabilize velocity, it has to be organized around something that's like a persistent object right. within the organization, right? Projects are by their very nature transient, transient, right? And so even like value streams are complicated because value streams tend to traverse the entire organization. That's right. Right. So the business capability modeling language. Was 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 pretty powerful. Yeah, it connected a lot. <coughs> a lot of the types of questions that we were trying to get answers to at the time, because um, I really wasn't coming at it from a Scrum standpoint. Yeah, you weren't. That wasn't. That wasn't. You're you're more of a lean um, doing some of the. Uh, oh gosh, what was the um, critical chain project management? Critical things like chain that. project yeah. management. Yeah, and I so I was trying to create stable capabilities so I could do buffers. Mm-hmm. To I was trying to manage dependencies between between capabilities in a project that we were delivering, right? Or yeah. Anything. And so I would use that um, that stable metaphor. If I can deliver this and then I can deliver this and I can figure out how big the gap is in between, I can, you know, get the gains and not lose the, not not lose when I have the problems, right? So how do I build a critical chain project plan to deliver? You were talking about doing it organizationally and using Scrum inside those those teams do it. So it was really, it was well, really well, interesting. Well, I think it's a fascinating intersection as, as we see how this conversation goes because – because in a way, you know, like like we're pretty on record for like dependencies or what gets in the way of almost all this stuff, right? That's right? So so we want to encapsulate business capabilities. You want to encapsulate dependencies within a Scrum team, but inevitably the Scrum teams have a value stream that goes across them. That's right, right. And so as you're trying to organize around business capabilities, you end up doing a lot of dependency management. That's right, all the way up. So that's some that's some heat we take sometimes, right? So talk to me a little bit about. Um, dependency management in a capability-based organization? So first off, first off, most organizations that we go into, um, the dependencies don't go away. The technical, the process, the funding, the organizational dependencies don't go away, regardless what you form scrum teams around. Regardless what teams you form, there's going to be dependencies between them to deliver anything. Yeah, so it's kind of like you pick your poison. You organize around products, you got dependencies between projects. You organize around projects, you got dependencies between business capabilities. Yeah, yeah and we, we find out now that we've got, we've got, dependencies between compliance and we've got dependencies with um, distribution and supply chain type Mm -hmm. stuff. We've got dependencies with marketing and how we're going to communicate things. What's interesting is unless you form around capabilities, it's really hard to get a tight lens to analyze all those together for how to manage it. But one of the things that we talked about is um, where do you want your complexity to lie? Where can I put the complexity so I can manage it? Mm -hmm. So if I can wrap a container around, around an outcome and take everything into consideration, compliance, procurement, um, process, dependencies, technology, competencies, make those manageable, then I can put my my complexity where I want it to be, where I can manage it. I can manage intercapability dependencies because, so the, because I've aligned everything else. So the capability of the Scrum team or the Scrum-based organization that's around this capability operates with independence and autonomy. As much within as pos- itself. Within itself, yep. But then it has to coordinate. There's some governance layer, something that coordinates backlogs across multiple teams. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Awesome. So um is is that the end state? Is that is that do we do we just want capability based no. organizations or well, like, well I, I do want capability yeah. based organizations, but I want capability organi- based organizations that are completely autonomous. They can actually operate as if there's no dependencies, as if all the testing and compliance and um, and everything is all solved for inside that team. Yeah, that's the best way to operate. But I can't, I can't pretend like those things are the teams are autonomous when they're not. So the teams don't just self organize those dependencies away. There's not a scrum master <laughs> that I've met yet at at one of our big pharmaceutical clients that can go change the human factors compliance rules with the FDA. Yeah, got right? it. Right. Yeah. Now that's just a stupid example, but yeah, it's everywhere. Well, well, I was just I was trying to be a little funny, right? Because that's that's one of the things that we talk about. It's like it's like. To, to move to this kind of organization and to deal with dependencies is often beyond the purview of a scrum team or an organization that goes all the way up to the top, right? So that's there has right. to be some intentionality around how that's designed. Yeah, and it's, it's, in, it's in every layer there. I was reading recently Joshua talking about- Karaski? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Starting, starting with, uh, with scrum and not technology. 
is a failure mode that he sees. And I, and I think, I think he's probably kind of right. If you really do start with scrum, not caring about technology. Yeah. But if you start with technology without deciding what you're going to build your teams around, it's also a failure. Mode. Yeah. So there's the, yeah. So like where the language I think you and I've probably centered around is the idea is that you form encapsulated teams around business components, business objects, business capabilities, right? Yep. That kind of a thing. And, and the, the, the people and the process and the technology should all be encapsulated and within that and That's aligned, right. right? The problem is, is when we have technology dependencies between different parts of the organization That's that right. go unmanaged, right? That's right. Okay, so that actually kind of begs the next question. So one of the things that you and I have been talking about for a long time is the difference between a system of delivery and a system of transformation. So talk to me a little bit about what those two things are and, and how they're different. Okay. Um, there's this concept of working on the system versus working in the system. So let's talk about the system of delivery. I'm working in the system. There's work I've got to get completed to deliver to a customer. There's things to get orchestrated. Things have to get signed off on. The customer has to pay for them. We're actually we're, producing the product. We're producing the products. There's okay. a system of delivery okay. and there's orchestration and dependencies and meaning that has to be made clear so in like the system a, of delivery. So like a PMI driven, PMBOK based organization, that's a system of delivery. System of delivery. Um, Safe would be safe, a system of delivery. Safe, safe, safe defines a reference architecture for a system of delivery. System of delivery. Blast, discipline, agile delivery, all systems Absolutely. of delivery. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. So what's the problem with just saying, okay, let's just, just do the system of delivery? The, in order for any of the systems of delivery to work, well, there's two major problems. The first one is in order for any of them to work, the conditions have to exist in the organization that take place, which means there's change you have to do to the organization. I'm going and saying we're going to train and implement safe when I have too many dependencies or I don't have all the right uh, players involved or I have constraints or if the problem I'm solving is a different problem than the one that safe solves for, safe in and of itself isn't sufficient. I have to be able to make the change to the organization. So hence the system of transformation. How do I get the buy-in from the organization? How do I script the changes I have to make the organization to get to that end state to make it work. So, so what you're saying is that I'm going to try to connect the two concepts together. So a system of delivery um, is basically all the processes and rules and frameworks necessary to deliver the work, to work in the product delivery organization. That's right. And, but to tie back to the business architecture thing, I, I would suggest that each system of delivery kind of implies a business architecture, and right? It implies right. Incorpor uh, encapsulated teams. It implies minimal dependency orchestration between teams. That's right. Things like that, a certain right? set of competencies. I have technical yeah. companies, whatever. So all those layers all have to exist at a certain level for that model, that reference architecture to work. So, so what we've seen, right, over the last... 10 years of working together is that people are installing systems of deliveries on top of business architectures that are incongruent Perfect. with those systems of deliveries. That's exactly so right. you agree with that? Yep. Okay, That's cool. exactly right. So therefore, system of transformation. System of transformation yeah. is understanding what the business architecture needs to be instantiated as in order for the target of system delivery to work. It's really interesting. It then becomes what can I actually do today? What compensating controls do I need to be managing today until I can shift the organization to where it needs to get to? So let's talk about that idea. That's a, that's a great word. I was actually thinking um, about that word compensating controls because yeah. that's something that I think Chris Beal coined for us, yeah. right? And so- I'm, I'm pretty sure we made it up. Yeah, we made up most of the really good ideas that we have, so no, it's okay. Chris has actually come up with some pretty good yeah, ones. He's a pretty yeah, smart so, yeah, so I think we're interviewing him next. So okay. um, yeah, so talk to me, like what's a compensating control and how does it apply to agile system of deliveries? Um, I'll use safe big room planning as an example. Okay. Um, safe big room planning uh, works when you have a bunch of information sorted out, a bunch of dependencies managed, a value stream can operate relatively autonomously. You can get everybody that has an interest in the next release. Or okay, the next so we have PI an encapsulated value stream. Have an encapsulated Everybody's value in the stream. Room. Dependencies are understood. Everybody yeah. understands the dependencies. Yeah. So that works. When, when that isn't possible because the technology is too complicated or the compliance and regulatory group hasn't uh, completely bought in yet or because your funding model is different or because you're using third-party vendors and things that you can't get in the room, you have to add stuff to the planning to get there, compensating controls. I can't make this model work this way. So there's a bunch of other stuff so I have it's, to do to make so it work. So it's something that you add to the methodology to compensate, 
for a condition that has yet to be created in the business architecture. Yeah. And it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Because that's not agile, Dennis. That doesn't sound very agile. Because I want because yeah. I want to add it. I want to add it with the intent yeah. of getting rid of it. Interesting. Go to, go a little deeper in that. Um, I'm going to add all this dependency management on top of this team because yeah. it's a reality today. But I also need to have a plan in my system of transformation for I'm going to eliminate those critical dependencies that allow me to operate without the compensating control. Right. So let's take, take take it really simple, right? So one of the things in Scrum that we've heard about for years is the idea of Scrum of Scrums. And so a Scrum of Scrums is really kind of a compensating control for dependency management yeah, within that's Scrum, right? right? Um, I think mine and yours challenge with it sometimes is it becomes a late dependency, a late risk reduction if, strategy. If, if, if the lead time on my dependencies or my risks are longer than the planning cycle for the Scrum team, mm-hmm. It's a problem. It's also difficult sometimes when you're trying to plan strategy if you don't know until you're done what's actually possible. Yeah. Like there's a, there, there's a little bit of a feed. There's a little bit of a feed forward that's a problem too from a strategy standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. My biggest challenge with um, and again, right. One of the things I think that's really interesting is that you know, when you have a chance to sit down with like Jeff Sutherland and and Ken Schwaber and those guys. I think they're really smart and really pragmatic. And and like I think sometimes as practitioners, we lock in scrum of scrums to be this really dogmatic thing. And I, th- I think they view it. I just want to be on record saying I think they view it as a more broad concept that's smartly applied in very right. contextual ways. Right. But and so like we've kind of implemented the scrum of scrums as like a product owner team concept. That's right. Right. Ideally, I would love each team to be operating independently. But when there's cross cutting concerns that have to be resolved across multiple teams and, you know, doing them um, late in the sprint cycle in a non planful way kind of creates chaos into the backlogs and creates late delivery and late risk reduction in the in the process. Yeah, right? and late risk yeah. risk reduction, late integration leads to technical problems. There's a vicious cycle yeah. that comes in with that as well. So one of the things that we just recently at a at a big client um, where they're doing scrum of scrums and scrum of scrum of scrums mm-hmm. and the whole model, executive meta scrums, the whole mm-hmm. sort of model, we took our governance model and laid it on top of it just to create some intentionality to the flow of value. Yeah. So the structure works and the compensating controls of our model can enhance that. Right. To, to make scrum of scrums work. It's been interesting. Um, the interesting dynamic has been, um, but in scrum of scrums, these teams should be able to operate autonomously. Well, I think, well, well yeah. They, but they can't yet. Well, that's the interesting thing, right? So so it's almost like two angles that I want to go down. It's like, it's like scrum of scrums, sure, fine. But like, I've, like scrum of scrums is commonly applied. It just happens too late. Is there anything that that's, that prevents us methodologically from saying, okay, we're just going to do early dependency identification, dependency management? No, but but in Scrum, right? Well, in, in, is, is that frowned upon? In, in Scrum, the challenge is this: this, this goes down a whole other interesting yeah. conversation, yeah, right? Sure. In Scrum, there's this concept of delegating dependencies really close to the metal, mm-hmm. so they can make them fast, really close to the point of contact. Um, the problem is if that dependency, we talked earlier about the scrum master, there's certain things he can't actually resolve. Yeah. If you delegate the dependency too low or too late in the system, then it actually slows the system down because the reality is that dependency can't get resolved that low and that late. Right. So we have to be intentional about where we put what we delegate decisions down to so that, so that it can be made appropriately. So, so in a highly dependent system, one of the compensating controls is that we need more upfront planning yes. than we would in a, in a pure play scrum environment. So how do you prevent that upfront planning from being waterfall? There's a couple of different things. One of them is to set actual limits on how big any piece of work that's committed up front can be. So batch sizing. Batch sizes, okay. smaller batch sizes. The other one is you have to measure the system. You have to like pay attention to it. And if you start to see batch sizes growing or there, there's a balancing, you know, Don Reinertson talks about this optimal batch size. Mm-hmm. There's some sort of thinking you can do about what the optimal batch size is. And we're continually through our system of transformation, improving our organization ability to make batches smaller. The optimal batch size should be getting smaller. If I might start out with six months as the smallest epic I can commit to in my system because it takes that long to get it through some very complex process. Okay. I want to get down to where in the future that's three months. I need to put together a plan to do that and change the rule around how big the batch size is. So so we understand that scrum teams are formed around the business architecture. Yep. That the business architecture initially has dependencies 
between them, which prevent us from oftentimes doing pure play scrum or even pure play safe. Almost inevitably in every place that we go today, Almost that of any non-trivial size, right? right? So I'm sure there's some small shops and small departments that where that's not or, as or, big Or even deal, like right? a website in a big company. But, sure. But most of the high value things- we're Enterprise level transformation, there are going to be large dependencies. scale dependencies, yep. right? That's Manufacturing right. companies, pharmaceutical companies, large financial services companies, that's things right. like that, product companies. Yeah. Okay. So, so a compensating control is in place in order to be able to deal with those dependencies, more forward planning. We don't really want them. It's not as agile as we'd like to be, but we're going to put in a compensating control to deal with those dependencies. Now, within that context, right, um, talk to me a little bit about what a system of transformation looks like, right? So how are we untangling that and then also like managing the process of untangling that? Because I think there's a lot of fear that if you put in these compensating controls, they'll never get undone. That they'll never get undone, right? And it'll stop us. Well, and that that is the risk. You know, in, in a lot of organizations that we go into, our, our, our first, our base camp one, we talk about base camp one, let's create a stable well, team. Well, so, okay, so hold that thought, right? So you, you forked it. So let's explain to everybody what a base camp is. So, so a base camp is an interim step on the way to an end goal. Okay, so we know where we want to be. We yeah, know we how to agile we want to be. We, okay. And, and we, we know how agile we want to be based on how that capability has to perform relevant to the market yeah. so we're so we can move at the speed of market. Okay. We can move at the speed that our customers and our market needs us to so we can be competitive. Okay. So now how fast we need to be. We know what conditions have to exist for us to operate there. Okay. If those conditions exist, just start doing it. But in very few organizations that we go into, does everything have the actual ability to operate at the speed that it needs to today? Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, most people, because the stuff is, is not well managed, they're operating as sort of a heroic, chaotic, um, superhero sort of model of getting work done. Mm-hmm. So what we talk a lot about is let's create stability in the organization and let's balance whip to the to the organization as it exists today. Okay, we can do that really really quickly, and um, throughput goes up, quality improves, clarity improves, trust improves. There's a lot of positive things that come from so that. Stabilize, stabilize backlog stabilize, or stabilize, teams, yep, get backlogs stabilize teams, in order. Stabilize the backlog. Yeah. Or, or um, manage dependencies, manage dependencies where dependencies. they are. Yeah, yep. sure. Yeah. Um, then we start to look at um, where can we economically improve? What's the next most important capability or type of work that we're doing mm-hmm. that needs to get done faster? And we'll start to decompose it into smaller pieces of work. So smaller batches pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll start to do the technical things that allow us to get faster feedback, um, but still at a relatively big chunk. But we'll start to base camp two is um, smaller batch size. Mm-hmm. But we're still operating within organizational constraints, architectural dependencies, some mm-hmm. competency limitations, right? Yeah. Base camp three is where we start to remove those things that uh, that are not the process that we're running or the way we break work down, but they're architectural or organizational or compliance or contractual types of things that stop us. We've got to break those dependencies so we can encapsulate a value stream and have that value stream move at the pace that it needs to to be competitive, okay. right? So there's like an inevitable ordering of that. The risk is a lot of times in the organizations, we get to base camp one and start to get to base camp two. And it's so much better than it used to be mm-hmm. that they forget how fast they have to move to go be successful in the market because yeah. they're, they're so much faster than they were. Right. So there's this, uh, the, 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 the risk of incremental stuff is it's reality. Well, there's like two, two places my brain forked while you were talking about that. So like the first one that I kind of wanted to say was it was fascinating, you know, cause you know, when we initially rebranded our website, like eight, nine years ago or something, we came up with this kind of like hiking outdoors metaphor, yeah. things like that. And so you and I were sitting at my conference table one time and we were using the word phases to describe phase of the project. And you're like, you're like, Mike, this word phase is overloaded. We're confusing our clients. They don't know if it's a phase of the engagement or, or if it was it, a phase is, of- Is it a right? phase of the yeah. system of delivery yeah. or a phase of the system of transformation? Yeah. So as I recall, and I might be, I might, there's some risk that I might be um, uh, making this story a little bit more dramatic than it was, but like, I remember getting annoyed because I'm like, you know, screw that, right? It's just, you know, it is what it is and it's clear and people need to get over it and stuff. And and I think I, I, think I went and Ran 30 minutes yeah, you on said, the treadmill. You, you excused yourself. And I'm pretty sure I came back with a vodka martini. I'm not 100% sure. I think that's also likely. But then but then we, um, I came back and went base camps, right? Because that kind of implied that you're going to make it to a like a known state yeah. and you're going to acclimate for a little bit. And then you're going to make it to the next known state and you're going to acclimate for a little bit. And then and then we started going down the language about expeditions. Yeah, we, that was the next one. Once we had yeah. base camps, you, well, then I remember the, the debate being, is an expedition the trip itself or is it the group of people that make the trip 
And and we understand now that it's a group of people that make the trip. It can actually technically be either, yeah. but we decided to say, okay, it's a group of people that make the trip, and then we call it a tr- like a trek, right? So we're like, yeah. you know, we're being brand consistent across this thing. So it's actually kind of interesting when we go into a client, and they're using the expedition base camp metaphor. Um, I think that's I think that's fairly powerful. The other place that my brain went that was interesting is is you talk about value streams and organizing around value streams. I think what one of the things, and I'd love you to comment on this, that we're seeing in some of the large clients is that it's it's almost impossible to organize around value streams yeah, it's when, more they, when they than first that. start yes. because all of the value streams intersect through the same capabilities. That's right. And so one of the patterns that we've been observing is that you organize around business capabilities first, right? Because that's actually easier to untangle. That's right. Then you orchestrate the value streams across the business capabilities, understand where your constraints are. What's cool about it, right? This is that's starting to emerge from our work is that is that once you do that, you see where there's overlap, you see where there's redundancy, you see you start to see things that go together. That's right. You can actually reorganize and group business capabilities that tend to work most often together into value streams. Yeah. So it's fascinating, right? So the industry is saying organize around value streams, but there's actually intermediate states necessary to get the shared cognition across the organization yeah. to make that happen, right? It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Right? And it's, yeah. A, it's absolutely correct. We need we need totally autonomous teams. Totally agree. We'd love them to be organized into value it, streams. Love it. it. Yeah. It, it isn't that easy yet. Yeah. So what is it going to take for us to get there? But it, it's really interesting, you know, coming with an architecture background, um, looking at... Um, we're going to refactor the architecture at some point. Like we know between base camp two and base mm-hmm. camp four, if we get there, that we're going to have to re-architect the design of the teams, the design of the orchestration. We're going to obviate the need for some of the managing of dependencies, some mm-hmm. of the some of the forward planning, because we're going to make us able to operate more tightly. Mm-hmm. And then we'll we need to eliminate those once we've made them unnecessary. So we're going to refactor some part of the organization. One of the things we ran into at one of our big financial services clients is getting the mainframe to base camp too, and then selectively moving pieces yeah. up the curve because yeah. the whole mainframe doesn't need to go up the curve, but some of the stuff needed to move really fast to be competitive in market. Yeah. Um, but how do you get the money and time and trust and everything, the organization to make that happen? So I'm, I'm going to fork a little bit here. Okay, cool. Go for but it. But the way that they operate historically, that decoupling and refactoring of the platform could never be absorbed into the cost of a project. Mm-hmm. Every individual project had to have the lowest possible cost with the highest initial ROI. Mm-hmm. But once we formed our own capabilities and made somebody own those different sets of capabilities, now I'm responsible not just for shoving the next project out the door at the lowest possible cost. I'm responsible for making this capability perform right. So it's like a Conway's Law It's kind a Conway's of a thing? Law. So the organization starts to care about the business people, the people that are funding the projects, start to care about paying for the refactoring, paying for the technical yeah, because they, want, they want the performance of their business capability to be better. And it's a business class yeah. problem, not a, well, you should have designed it that way in the first place. You should be operating that way anyway. Why'd you build it wrong in the first well, place? Well, so this is what I think is fascinating, right? And this is what I think is part of the power of what we've we've discovered, right? What we've uncovered over these last 10 years is that is that we always talk about how do you get the business more engaged? And like the, the collected wisdom is, well, you want to make sure every team has a product owner on it, right? And that product owner is the voice of the business. I don't think that actually is a pattern that works, right? It's not sufficient. How you do is you make the business responsible, like that business capability encapsulate the technology and make them jointly responsible for the, for the performance of that business capability. That's right. It's yeah. a, it's a, a PNL around a little business unit, a general manager sort of concept owns the technology and the process and the competencies and the rules and regulations yeah. align all of it. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? And so, and so, which kind of begs the next question. One of the things that you've been talking about for at least a year now is the idea that um, transformation work is is often not being funded out of IT anymore. Talk to me a little bit about what you see changing in the market right now. Of of the four, we started seeing this probably yeah, like a year and a half, maybe two years ago, where um, IT feels like they can do Scrum and they've solved the problem for what they're responsible for. I can now kind of accurately deliver software. Um, I have enough orchestration that I can be responsible for that. And they've, they've isolated themselves from the problem. The business is going, but I'm not getting what I need out of it. So I need to be able to make So we've, change. we've actually like fixed the engine. We've gotten it performing, but it's kind of taking us to the wrong place. Kind of maybe? taking us to the wrong yeah, place. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not able, I don't have enough influence or control. I don't know. I think the real answer is I don't know how to exploit this new engine. Yeah in an effective way, because I'm used to operating this way. Yeah. They seem to have like did all the things that they said they were going to do. Yeah. Um, 
but we're not really getting the benefit yet. So on the business side, we start going, okay, so let's talk about how you can start to exploit this engine to compete in the market, to leverage this way, to play that way. Let's start to talk about how you can build trust with IT. So you're not funding um, technical debt that clogs you up next year, right? And how you become responsible for owning that. So the business now, and three of my four clients, three of my four clients mm -hmm. are all being funded specifically from the business side mm -hmm. to take advantage of, of the, the technology delivery well, this is an important topic because because the one of the questions that I get asked out speaking at agile conferences is how do we get the business to be engaged, mm -hmm. right? So so you've got several clients where the business is engaged. Maybe maybe the question I want to ask you is how do you keep them engaged? What do, what do they care about? What's valuable to the business? Yeah. So the challenge has been and probably still continues to be flipping the conversation from a how good are we at lead time or scrums or defects and like that to how many dollars are we getting back into the company? How many customers are we retaining? How how cost effectively are we solving? It becomes a capability outcome conversation mm -hmm. rather than a technology conversation. But until we got the organization sort of stable, it didn't matter. You couldn't you couldn't deliver on a capability outcome conversation. So, so there's a chicken and the egg problem. It's like, and this is like a little bit of the debate that we've had over the last couple of years with Scott Selhorst and you. Like it's like it's like product people show up and they're like, well, we have to make sure that we're we understand our customers and we understand personas and we understand what the market wants and all this different stuff. And then on this on our side, like our historical side is leading agile, we're like, but you can't produce anything. It so what does it matter? It doesn't right? matter, right? I'm right. So it's like on the one hand, you almost have to like unlock the system so it's capable of producing something. Yeah. And then you've got to figure out how to exploit that system to be able to advance your product and market in a way that the customer will buy. Yeah. There's yeah. I have I have no ability to learn anything and adapt because my delivery system is so locked in. My 18 months roadmaps are locked down and there's yeah. no way to learn and pivot. We've now fixed that. The business doesn't really know how to leverage it yet. They're still trying to shove giant things in or or um, they just don't know how to, they, the, the, the collaboration is not there. So we're fixing that on the business side in a lot of our organizations now. Um, what becomes really interesting about it is that it's a much healthier conversation. Conversations that used to be really threatening. Okay, you know, you're not going to get everything you asked for in the time frame you want it. So let's sit down in the way that we now do this thing and come up with the smallest thing we can possibly deliver in the next 90 days. So I'm going to build an argument here, right? So you've got the business architecture, right? Which is basically the business capability. It's supporting technology. It's people. It has performance characteristics. That's right. The business owns those performance characteristics. That's right. And so the alignment between IT and the business is basically creating shared accountability for the performance of that capability. Yes. So then, so then now we've got shared alignment at the execution level. And I imagine there's something you do at the program level, the portfolio level, and the strategy level to make sure that that, that kind of zippers all the way up and that the business is connected all the way through the stack. There's, there's some language that um, started becoming sort of well-known in the industry probably five or six years ago. It really goes way back to Intel and managed by, by, by objectives type thing, but it's, it's mm -hmm. OKRs, objectives and key results. Um, it, it was a fascinatingly failure sort of thing when you did it the organization couldn't respond mm -hmm. so it's not the right place to start um but once you get the system working it's probably necessary to create clarity up and down the stack mm -hmm. to align everybody to align all those different interests around outcomes you've got to make those be very explicit so it's interesting it's like the technology problem just to now a step further removed it's not that we don't want to start with technology it's until i have stable teams that can build a backlog mm -hmm. i can't take advantage of good technology good technology is absolutely critical and key yeah. to be successful. And I got good process, got some pretty good alignment around technology. Now I've got to be able to point it at the right thing. And in reality, it's nowhere near that linear. It's like it's like layers upon yeah. layers. Well, I was going to say, because when we in, in initially kind of um, started talking about the base camp model, right? Yeah. We have base camp one, two, and we talked about the idea of stabilize the system, reduce batch size, break dependencies, invest in, you know, capability-based teams, right? Innovate, right? Those kinds of things. But what we've kind of learned is that while you're stabilizing the system, there's things that you need to be doing to lay, um, to start developing conceptual shared understanding on the product side. That's right. There's technology things that you have to be laying down. That's right. Because as soon as you stabilize the system in order to reduce batch size, you're going to have to start dealing it. with release management. You're going to start having to break right. product ideas up into smaller pieces, right? That yeah. kind of a thing. And, yeah. and you can't do it across an entire enterprise. It makes sense to invest and move you know, this 10% of your organization, because that's where you really have to be fast to compete in the yeah, market. That's where the expedition idea came that's in, That's the expedition right? idea. Yeah, okay, let's, take this, let's take this slice, and then here's its journey. And its journey is going to be a little bit different than this slice's journey. And this one's not economically even viable to go past 
so base camp two right now. Base camp one or two, yeah. Yeah. So so that's that. That's all system of transformation type stuff. So talk to me a little bit about like how do you create shared cognition across a client organization to get everybody with their head around. How do you incrementally and iteratively transform this enterprise? Like, that's, what are some of the things you do? That's a ton of the power of just the language of if we can get agreement on on capabilities or products or the things we're going to form the organization around, and then we have our quadrants, and we can talk about where does it actually need to live to be competitive in the market, and then we can talk about what are the constraints that exist there. The organization, like in our two-day or define the end state sort of workshops, mm-hmm. um, six, eight weeks sort of work out there. We can get an organization across the board to kind of go, oh, you know what? We're actually operating at zero. We probably need to be at three. Here's the things that block us from getting to three. Here's a path from the scripts to get us there. You can build a pretty clear plan Mm -hmm. to help the organization move. And then you can sit there and go, and of all 100 things in your organization, these are the 10 next most important ones to move. And we'll move these other 90 to base camp one because we can kind of do that in a a scripted way. Um, The the understanding, the simplification of the metaphor of the whole model allows us to get a lot of buy-in from the organization. So we do something that's that I think is fairly controversial in our industry right now, right? So we'll take um, we'll take a big organization, we'll break it up into smaller pieces called expeditions, right? Mm-hmm. We'll run them through these intermediate states called base camps. Yep. Um, the base camps will have intermediate outcomes that's right. that we can start to measure progress towards. What we found is that there's kind of a standard set of activities and kinds of things that have to be done on every engagement to move an organization forward, it starts to look a whole lot like a Gantt chart. So you know, talk to me a little bit about why isn't that more em- emergent in practice? Well, well, I think there's a couple of parts to why it's not emergent. The first one is there's just some physics to how organizations work and how organizational dynamics and where where people are. There's another part of it that's important to, to intuitively figure out how to navigate that very complex script from where you are to where you're going to go. It takes a genius with 100 years of experience that could do like a very tailored path through that. So you're saying a thousand people self-organizing are not going to just randomly come up with that approach? They're not going to come up with that approach. So what we do is we go, you know, there may be some inefficiencies for these two teams to go through our scripted sort of path. Mm -hmm. There may be some inefficiencies and maybe we can do something for those to make them move a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. But all the rest of the organization, I need management to understand where we're going. I can't go hire all 20 year experienced scrum organizational change people, coaches to well, drive this. I, I think even if you did, I think they would just all get in the room and fight with each other. They would. They don't. Yeah. Right? Right, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so even if I could get them, I can't align them. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and the, the constraints are not within the teams. The constraints are in the fabric of the organization. Yeah. So it's, it's getting the fabric of the organization aligned. It's creating the conditions for those teams to even operate that way. And so some of what's happening while the scrum teams are forming, we're solving the program team stuff or the product owner team stuff in a relatively coherent way because they have to manage dependencies between each other. And we're forming, we're solving the portfolio thing more broadly. We're creating the conditions for those scrum teams to even be successful. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about, um, in one of the talks that I've given over the last couple of years, I talk about two different kinds of metrics. I would call transformation metrics and then like business performance metrics. Mm -hmm. So on an engagement, we will talk about um, how do we know that we're doing the things we said we're going to do, right? And getting to the outcomes that we we want um, versus how do we know that's actually um, improving the performance characteristics from a business perspective of the organization. Talk a little bit about how you measure those two different things on an engagement. So one is measuring the system of delivery and okay. one's measuring the results of the system of transformation. Okay. So on the system of transformation side, I have observable things I can see a team do. There, there's a slippery slope on transformation stuff. I'm not measuring how many people I've sent scrum masters to scrum training. Or That's kind ma- of a vanity metric, I yeah. think, right? Yeah, yeah. Really, but I'm looking at how many people know how to build a backlog. How many people know how to put it in the tool? How many people know how to produce their their metrics so they can measure it? How many mm-hmm. people know how to make and keep a sprint plan? Like we have can actually stabilize can, can actually velocity, stabilize yeah. velocity. Can yeah. actually bring their dependencies to a release planning event now with mm-hmm. their stable velocity and negotiate to do a release plan. There's a really clear sort of set of measurable, definable, observable outcomes. Things that have to be true no matter what. That, that have to be true yeah. for them to get there. And yeah. so we've laid that out. And some teams can move fast. Some teams can move slow. But I can sit there and put up on a board. And go, Mr. CEO, in this part of the organization, these eight capability-based teams that were critically important to you are now good at these new things. And I can show them because I can observe it. I can observe it. I can look and I can show you their predictability metrics are there. Mm -hmm. Their responsiveness metrics are there. Their quality metrics are there. And so we're getting the result in changing the organization that we said we would. That's one side of the thing. 
On the other side, I want to look at and I want to go, okay, so am I getting, am I able to keep, make and keep promises to my customer? How many times did we sign a deal with a customer that we delivered on time? How many times did I ship something to the customer that, that broke? How many, how, how am I improving my actual lead time in delivering to the customer? How am I getting more frequent uh, time to cash? I'm reducing my time to cash. So there's a set of, of business metrics that are very observable, but they're not lead time by how fast a scrum team spins. They're measured by how frequently and cleanly we can put product in the customer's hands. I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, but one of our larger clients um, is a is a Rally CA customer. I still call it Rally. It's like I'm like old school. They're calling it Rally again. Are they calling it yeah. Rally again? Oh, fascinating. Okay, cool. So um, being a V1 guy, right? I didn't grow up in that ecosystem, but apparently they've got some um, performance metrics, like industry based on metrics, and you can actually start to see as a result of some of the things we're doing how these teams are performing against like predictability, batch size, making meeting commitments it's kind of neat it's fascinating it's, it's, to watch. it's actually kind of breathtaking yeah how well it's working at scale yeah with this model it's like it's um um yeah the the percentages of of teams that are moving up way above the norm mm -hmm. um or it's extraordinary yeah so it, it's it's interesting right it's like if we can if we can stop being so myopic and say that you know everything has to be emergent just teach people scrum let them self-organize right if we can get our head out of that world and recognize that that we're basically re-architecting a system so teams can operate independently but the performance characteristics the architecture of that organization is not emergent right that that can actually be designed very thoughtfully to create a performant enterprise right it's pretty cool yeah it should be yeah 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 awesome okay so let's um let's let's talk a little bit we had a fascinating conversation so this is like totally like hot off the presses um i was like blown away like i was talking with when we were on the call this morning talking with chris about um this this third leg that we're that we're starting to deal with in some of our engagements around i think we're like for lack of a better word system of sustainability right yeah so we've used the system of transformation to in effect install a system of delivery but we also know that to some degree that organization is going to be dynamic and continue to improve so, right so as strategy changes different business capabilities are going to light up in different ways That's right. as as you've reorganized capabilities into value streams right the performance of those um, those uh, value streams are going to ebb and flow as you deal with constraints in different parts of the organization as right? your understanding of how you're going to be competitive in the market changes you're going to want to light up different capabilities yeah the performance characteristics it, and, it, and it's fascinating right so it's like if you if you think about it it's in it's not only insufficient to put in a system of delivery, right? You have to understand how you're going to put it in. And then you have to understand how is it going to evolve yeah. because it's not going to be static over There's, time. So talk to me a little bit about your thoughts because I think this is the future <clears throat> of like a truly adaptive agile enterprise. Yeah, there's um, the some of the language that's been very interesting to me um, is if a scrum master's job is to protect the organization from management so the scrum team can be effective. Yeah, we've probably already failed. Eventually, management is yeah. going to win. <laughs> yeah, they are, right? For right? sure. So, so part of building a sustainable system is getting management to understand how to exploit and leverage the system. Getting business to want to use IT in this new model to get outcomes they couldn't get before. Sure. There's a ton of, first off, just teaching, creating, creating awareness and a desire on the part of the people that sometimes fight with the system today, that they want this new system to exist. Mm -hmm. So that's probably an ongoing part of, of sustainability is getting management leadership to want to follow it. There's an important aspect then, which is how do we then measure our, our performance of how the system's working so we can identify where it's slipping or where it's changing, um, where the need is changing, how do we go and look at the performance characteristics and measure it? So I need I need the ability to look at my organization, understand where it's not performant, but not at the individual process level. We had an interesting conversation mm -hmm. this morning about about BPR versus Six Sigma versus some of mm -hmm. the competency based things. Yeah. They were they were looking at the at in a in a micro lens because organizations weren't designed mm -hmm. in a way they could look at it in a macro lens. So when you start to get these things pulled together relatively autonomously, start to understand the network start to really leverage the business architecture. All the things those guys were doing were probably useful, but because the organization wasn't yeah. set up to exploit it. Well, 
So I'm going to go down a rabbit hole for yeah. just a moment, right? Give me a minute or two on this. And I'm going to speak something into the universe that I think is like super important. So, you know, I do a bunch of University of Florida guy, right? Yep. And so just for the record, um, Dennis is a Florida State guy, right? So we, yeah. there's a day, a year, we don't like each other. I've, I've learned to respect Mike regardless. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, it goes both ways. So, um, so I'm a University of Florida guy. And so I, I do volunteer work down there and work a lot with the, the College of Industrial and Systems Engineering. And what I think is fascinating is a lot of these industrial and systems engineers, when they go through their internships and they get their early jobs, jobs, they're like, they're looking at like how to process improve something small. And then they process improve something big, right? And then they might have like an like an overall process improvement kind of a thing. But I think there's an interesting frontier around taking the discipline of industrial and systems engineering and and applying it to software organizations. Like what is the software factory look like yes. per se, right? How do you re-engineer it? How do you optimize the plant floor? when the plant floor are thousands of people sitting in cubes looking at computers. And it's, and it's essentially invisible if you don't and have it's a way invisible, to understand right? it. Yeah, right? for yeah, sure. that's exactly right. And, um, and so this is why that business architecture lens to me has always been important. Yeah. You gotta have a way to look at it, but then you have to teach management. This is about um, what does good performance look like in a big organization today? And is it the, is it the line manager who manages his budget and makes sure all those people show up time? Like, like the things that are performant today Mm -hmm. Those are probably still important. Like we can't just spend money, but are we really getting the results that we want? If I can go, if I can go spend that money and deliver the outcomes I'm responsible for in the network of thing, if I never miss a dependency from my capability that blocks anything of value to another group, if I am, um, if I'm achieving uh, the business outcomes, the business capability outcomes, um, and reducing my cost and improving my adaptability within my group, but I'm doing it in a way that it releases more value for the whole organization mm -hmm. then i'm being successful but i don't think we look at that we don't have a lens to understand that um we were just reading an hbr article earlier this week about how most organizations feel like they're pretty well aligned in silos mm -hmm. but 92 percent of managers feel like they can't trust their adjacent silos any more than they can a vendor they haven't paid yet mm -hmm. so so they still can't get anything out the, the door yeah when we start to get the organization aligned through our uh, get our system of delivery in place and it's aligned that way, we can teach management how to run it, we'll start to solve those types of problems. Yeah, it's fascinating. Right? So so yes, there's, there's layers that. How do we teach managers to run this new organization, I think, is a system of sustainability. So I have a hypothesis, this last theme that I want to hit you with, right? I want to get your thoughts on it. So, um, you know, I think a lot of what we've actually built is um, – is less a agile transformation framework, although it is very much an agile transformation mm -hmm. framework, but it's more a generalized change management framework, yeah. right? Talk to me a little bit about that. Where do you see what we're building going? The, the tools and techniques, the ability to get people to change, the ability to get management to buy in and follow a process, the ability to measure what has to happen, break it down, decompose it, create the change. Um, you know, you look at the different change management cycles, the, the Cotter sort of eight steps, and you look mm -hmm. at the ADCAR mm -hmm. sort of individual, so organizational change, individual change models. Mm -hmm. um, those things are probably inherently true, mm -hmm. regardless Great. of what you're putting in the ground. Yeah. Um, so um, applying this model to um, rolling out some manufacturing changes in your manufacturing process, or, you know, what we're doing, what we're doing with our big compliant, with our big... Um, a uh, pharmaceutical client right now is we're changing their compliance organization dramatically, their human factors, their mm -hmm. FDA compliance, their regulatory group. We're changing that organization dramatically in a way that's never happened before. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we're applying scrum and sprints. It's because we're we're applying our, let's focus on getting the value. Let's look at what the constraints are to the capabilities moving at the rate they need to. How do you guys interface? What do you need to be successful? Mm -hmm. We're applying our change model of things outside of so Technology. when you start to look at it as business capabilities that get orchestrated across, you know, value streams or product areas mm -hmm. or things like that, it becomes more generalized. So we've historically applied it into software and IT organizations, but I think it's fascinating watching it because now we've taken this business architecture view of it, that it's, it's actually more generally applicable. That's right. So, um, you know, one of the books I read probably 15 years ago that I'm actually rereading right now is that I think it's Chip and Dan Heath, the switch yeah, book, right? Switch, switch. Where you have the, it's, it was, so it's fascinating, right? So you have like the, you have the elephant, the rider and the path. And so the rider is like the cognitive understanding. Um, the elephant is the emotional, like, I just got to get there because it's super important kind of a thing. And then the path is like the guardrails, 
right? And so I and I think about like what we do and like how some of that is like so deeply entwined, right? So absolutely trying to appeal to the intellect, but to try to create that emotional gloves on the table, like, you know, like, like it's data, it's important, it's moving the industry, but then also like giving enough guidance and structure that it's safe. for how to get there and it's safe. Yep. Because that's the thing is I think, I think people underestimate how scary it is to do this stuff, right? And to tell somebody you're smart people, you're close to the ground, just figure it out because they have to go into conflict with each other. They have to fight. They have to put themselves at risk, right? All that stuff. And so one of the things I think is really interesting about codifying some of this stuff is that it does. It creates a tremendous amount of safety to get people started. Maybe it's not ideal. Maybe it's too much of a compensating controls, but I think it's moving people in the right direction. And, and I think the other thing that's critical about what we've done, and it's applying the whole model. We're also getting feedback about whether you're heading in the right direction so you can yeah. you can adjust if can you're adjust going if the right direction. Right? Yeah, like how would you know? Like, okay, we're just trying to teach a bunch of people Scrum. Like, how's it? Just, just like, go figure it out. Just go do your best. How, how do we know that people it's actually doing all the right, right? things? Yeah. They could be at odds with each other, right? But if, if this is what it means to be good at this, and this is what it means to be good at that, and this is what it means to be good at that, and I can measure that, I can turn that into a set of 10 steps, things I need that have to be true yeah. for me to be good at that. Well, one of the things I always ask people is I go, okay, so let's say you're a king for the day. You could change anything you wanted. Like you'd snap your fingers and change anything. What would you go change? I'd, right? get, I'd get management to support the transformation. Well, yeah, right. So what what everybody what everybody wants is like they want to overcome the cultural resistance, you right. know? And so what I think is fascinating is that like once you take that off the table, there's not a lot of people that like know what to go do. That's right. Right. Like what, what do you specifically go do? Okay. Okay. Joshua, you want to go do the technical practices. Like where do you start? How do you start? Right. If it matters that you're actually able to move the needle in three to six months, like in a measurable way, like what right. do you go do? Right. And most people don't, don't have that answer. And so I'm actually really proud of us that we've actually kind of figured some of that stuff out. It's pretty cool. And it's, and it's, um, and while we're still learning, yeah, um, it's working. It's working, it's working pretty, pretty well. well. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for joining me, Dennis. This is an awesome conversation. No, thanks for having me. It's great to see you.